In the first part of our interview with Ken Penders, we spoke of how he first became involved with and progressed Sonic and Knuckles for Archie Comics. In the second part, the lawsuit with Archie Comics was broken down to its cellular components, and information many might find surprising was revealed, so be sure to check that out. Now, in the third and final part, we will talk about the movies, both Armageddon and the one which made it to theaters, and the current status of the Lara Sioux Chronicles. Speaking of uh, something uh, new, you mentioned movie that you're setting up, and we'll get back to that a little bit later on. Before that, uh, there was an earlier iteration of a Sonic movie, Sonic Armageddon. Sonic Armageddon uh, was the movie project that um, Larry and I initially pitched to Sega back in 2003. And... um, uh, Bernie was involved too, as a matter of fact, because uh, Bernie's forte is discu- able to discuss business and finances with uh, executive suits on their level. Uh, Larry can do that, but he's more into the production end uh, as far as you know, actually getting a project off the ground and seeing it through to completion. And I was the Sonic creative guy. So e- each of the three of us, had our own aspect we brought to the table when when meeting with Sega to uh, discuss what we wanted to do. And so we had initially contacted Sega licensing manager, Robert Leffler, and he set up a meeting uh, for us to meet with him and two Sega of Japan executives at this hotel in Hollywood back in September 2003 met for breakfast. It was a very casual, very uh, informative uh, meeting. And I had brought some production pieces of art. You can see um, the one back here. That was one of the pieces uh, that was submitted to Sega. Had, you can see the characters. It wasn't just Sonic. It was the characters from the comics. And we did a I did a little bit of a design change on the majority of the characters uh, for the simple reason of uh, copyrights and trademarks in that here, Sonic, they have a license with one toy manufacturer for Sonic as he looks. So just making, you know, a change in uh, his shoes, for example, um, we would be able to include that as part of the marketing uh, for the licensed products for the project. So we were addressing all sorts of aspects. As a matter of fact, uh, we were discussing uh, how the way we want to do the film, that we would be able to repurpose, you know, many of the assets created for the film so that Sega could use them in a video game that could be released at the same time the movie came out. So the executives very much were interested in what we were pitching to them. Um, And uh, they were telling us that uh, they had been very unhappy with their previous uh, studio encounters because what they discovered is the studios they were doing business with, uh, one of them actually licensed Sonic to make a film. Only the, the only purpose was though, they wanted to bury it because they had a competing product competing character they wanted to promote instead and they felt that sonic was a threat to their efforts to promote you know their project so you know sonic lay dormant for a couple of years because of this effort and sega didn't want that to happen again they really wanted this thing to move and so we were prepared to discuss you know how we were going to get financing you know what would what we would pay them and so on and so forth and that's when the, the Sega of Japan executives surprised us uh, by saying they wanted to do a partnership where, you know, they would get involved in the financing of the project. And, you know, Larry, Bernie, and I are keeping straight faces and afterwards where they're going, wow, did we hear what we just heard? You know, and I was going to respond back to the Sega executives, you know, and it was really amazing, but within 24 hours, uh, Sega had a purge, and those executives were just gone with the wind after that. 
in strategic timing. Oh yeah, no kidding. So so you know, we had to pick up the pieces with Bob Leffler. And part of the problem was Sega of America and Sega of Japan weren't exactly seeing eye to eye. So it was a while that um, uh, you know Bob was trying to get the stars aligned again. He was working with us. And then he got word that Sega of Japan entered into an agreement to produce the Sonic X series. And that Sonic, you know, has a, as a licensed character was off the market for the next two years as a result of the, the Sonic X agreement. So Larry and I were working with Bob to see about, you know, licensing other Sega properties, you know, such as Fantasy Star, uh, to see if we, you know, if we could get something launched just to show that, yes, we could do what we claim to do. We could get a, a an animated film made, you know, based off a of Sega property, you know, and, and go from there. If we establish this business relationship, track record, you know, that we, we did what we said we would do, you know, that would make it easier to get the Sonic license, you know, once the Sonic X uh, series ran its course. So Bob kept us in the loop the entire time. And we were working on this, and um, and uh, we were uh, thinking, okay, let's let's see what happens. And then, as things kept rolling along, you know, like Bob met with us at uh, Comic Con every year during this time. And as a matter of fact, when Sega showed up at E3 between the years um, 2004, 2005, and six. We met Sega at their booth. They they gave us uh, passes all those years, you know, so we could meet up and discuss and and, and see uh, where we were. And then 2007 came along, and I had a friend who helped us set up a website. It had the production art. It had uh, a budget worked out. It had who we were, who we had access to because of Larry's contacts. And I did a short animatic, you know, establishing that uh, the film would open uh, with Sonic as, as a young kid, you know, and uh, uh, he, he had his own flying skateboard. You know, we were trying to establish some of the tech of that world. And, um, and basically, uh, it was going to be an origin story that took him from uh, kids to, you know, the next stage. And we wanted to get away from uh, the setup that Saturday AM had and go beyond that. So, uh, you know, we were setting up a scenario where uh, Robotnik wouldn't necessarily be the villain in the next film, you know, like there would be defeat and there, you know, the world would be a better place. Okay. So what happens next? That kind of thing. Um, and, so, and it was going to be based off the comics and Sega was, you know, all during this time, Sega was very much interested in that. And then Bob died. So then when we met um, Rob Leitner in Beverly Hills, we thought, you know, because we nobody had gotten this, you know, the, the Sonic uh, meeting off the ground, you know, that the company w was going to hold, that we thought we're back to square one trying to get Fantasy Star or some other Sega property license and that's when rob leitner said to us during that meeting why are you talking to me about fantasy star let's talk sonic and we said really you really want to talk sonic and he goes yeah that's what i want to talk and so we gave him the same pitch that we gave bob and it looked like we were going to move forward from there and again sega was having great corporate appeal so again didn't go any further after that and you know um, by that, by the time the lawsuit happened, I mean, me going after uh, the copyrights, it just didn't see how things were going to work out until we, uh, we saw how that thing progressed. So and that's where Sonic Armageddon ended up. You know, what it could have should have, you know. Of course, now much later, as in very, very recently, we did get a Sonic movie in the end, which is currently in theaters. Have you seen it yet? 
Uh, yes, I have. And I, I have to tell you, uh, it was much better than I thought it would be based on the trailers. Okay, in all fairness. I have since tweeted, you know, congrats to the guys who made it. Um, hey, they accomplished it. We didn't. You know, they earned the success. You know, there'll probably be an inevitable sequel. You know, they earned it. Um, it's it's not the story I would have done, but, you know, it, I, I'm not going to use that as a complaint against, against the movie. You know, it is what it is. This is what they got off the ground. This is how they were able to secure the funding. So, you know, more power to them. Uh, you mentioned it's not the movie that you would have done. No, if not. you could have chosen, what movie would you have done? Um, I definitely would have gone back to what we were going to do with Sonic Armageddon. It's not like I was going to reinvent the wheel. I was going to, you know, do what we were planning to do, you know, and essentially base the film off of what we were doing with the Archie comic because it's always been my contention if you look at the, you know, what's been most successful in, in the theaters in, in recent years, it's movies based on comic books. Okay, Marvel's got the right approach. Uh, they've got years of readership that is invested in these characters. That, you know, because Marvel is taking great care and love in making their films, the fans have responded to that and. DC, when they pay attention to the fans, they get similar results. I mean, you look at Aquaman, Wonder Woman, Shazam. Those are great films. The Dark Knight, that was a terrific film. Man of Steel, they, they had the wrong person in charge of that, and the, the results speak for themselves. Same with the Justice League. They had the wrong person who started the film, and they had to bring in you know another director to finish off the thing. Yes, I know the first director suffered a tremendous tragedy, and my heart goes out to him and his family over that, but I just didn't agree with that director's vision of where he was taking the characters. I mean, he has stated himself that uh, he thinks these characters should be much darker than how they're portrayed. And my question to him is, why did you take the gig if you don't believe in these characters. Let's okay. uh, let's get back to Sonic for a moment, because speaking of designs and uh, uh, why do you take the gig, there's one thing that is, uh, uh, I'm not going to say controversy, because everyone rejoices and loves it, but uh, famously then, in this Sonic movie, they changed the design midstream after the first trailer, when audiences worldwide reeled at the initial design. Then the movie was pushed back, and uh, the design was redone to bring Sonic closer to both the comic book and the games. What do you think about that decision? Should they have stuck with their initial vision, or did they do the right call in changing the design? Personally, I thought that they should have gone with the, the, the final design you know, from the get-go. That's what we would have done. You know, we, you know, that was one wheel we were not going to reinvent was the look of Sonic at all. You know, so I, I couldn't understand why they did that version, though, the version they had for initially, why they even went that route in the first place. You know? I mean, if you look at the Pikachu movie, they gave the Pikachu fans Pikachu. They did not try to redesign Pikachu. They did not try to redesign, you know, any of the Pokemon. They gave the fans the characters, you know, so I I don't understand what was going through their heads initially when they did that. You know, they could have saved themselves a lot of grief and expense. But again, I'm not here to rain on anybody's parade. You know, in the end, they listened to the fans. They made the right call. They came out, you know, with the design that they did, and it worked. You know, there's I'm not going to climb on their backs, you know, for making a bad decision initially. Okay. Let's uh, move a little bit back to your own projects, uh, because you then got the copyright to about 200 or so characters that yes. uh, that you created yes. for, um, for the Sonic Archie comics. Yes. And since you've been working on getting these characters into your own series, the Lara Sue Chronicles, how is that coming along? 
it's actually coming along really good. I, for example, um, the initial graphic novel is going to be something like between 160 and 180 pages when finished. Um, and at the, at the same time while I'm working on it, I'm doing it everything digitally so I can repurpose the assets for uh, various formats, not just uh, for the graphic novel, but for any uh, commercial products, for uh, any posters, any, any prints, that kind of thing. Um, and, and basically, uh, I'm looking at the initial release as digital, meaning you're going to download an app, you're going to get the first chapter of the story, and you're going to download additional chapters as they get completed. So uh, I've been developing this app as a means of getting it out to the public. I've been having assistance with that. And there are various features to the app because it's, it's not just a matter of reading the comic, okay? Um, and it's not just a matter of having an American audience. I, I see uh, for, for something to be successful now, you have to aim for a global audience. And as such, you have to make it uh, friendly. You know, say if somebody in, in Norway or Germany or Japan or some, anywhere downloads the app, that they can enjoy it. So I've been incorporating um, language translations, you know, as part of the package, as well as uh, a limited um, amount of animation features and um, and an audio tracks as well. So it, it's it's not just a, uh, a comic book experience, it's, it's a multimedia experience. Uh, so that is what's been taking a, a, a lot of time is getting all these uh, elements incorporated, you know, correctly, um, and making it all work. So it's, it, you know, I could I could do a comic book page and get it out there real quick, post it up on the internet, and you, and you got there. But that's that's not the end game. It's not the goal. Uh, it's it's to it's to provide this experience that's uh, unique, uh, that's different from. You know, this is worth your time and money. So, and this is something that's, I see the form, I see comics evolving. I see entertainment evolving. And I think and the app is where I think things are going to evolve to. It's not just going to be a uh, matter of just writing and drawing the story. It's, got, it's going to be more complex than that. So that's been taking a, a lot of time getting it right because you only have one chance. You have only one introduction to the public, and once they see that, you know, that's how you know if you're going to succeed or fail. And so far, like I do have a beta version of the app with material incorporated into it. Um, and whenever anybody has seen it, they're quite happy with it. They they're they're really impressed with it. So, you know, uh, I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm hoping sometime this summer, but you know, fingers are crossed. Uh, the other thing is, so uh, to uh, the other thing I'm doing with the material that I have ownership of, like I'm taking the uh, Mobius 25 Years Later stories, and I am grouping them together along with some of the new material I created, and I'm going to release um, a hardcover edition. And it's going to be called Laura Sue Chronicles Beginnings. You know, you don't have to get this book, but, you know, for the fans who read the stories and, you know, would like to have it all in one nice collectible edition, here it is, you know, and see where the storyline is going. And for those who are just new to the story and want to see what came before, this is going to be a nice way to do it. So that's what I'm working on as well as the release of the app. And then there's um, my film project, which I'm on the verge of finally, finally seeing uh, a finished version ready to submit to various parties and see what happens from there. What can you tell us about this film project, if anything, at this point? Oh, I can. As a matter of fact, you can you can get a hint of it on the Facebook uh, site uh, under the Republic TV drama uh, page. It stars Mark Singer uh, and uh, Sean Young. 
You know, Mark was uh, the leading actor. The Beastmaster himself. Yes, he's Beastmaster and, and V. I met him. Nice guy. Yeah. Oh, he is. He's, he's a terrific guy. You know, he was he was fun to work with. And Sean, she she was funny. She was beautiful. She she was a true professional. I don't again, she's one of these controversial figures that you shouldn't believe everything you read about her because um especially she is a real professional. I mean, she was never anything less than with us. I mean, we were a low, low budget thing, and she was always on time. She she was a joy to work with. Um, our business dealings with her were always straightforward. There were no games. I mean, I, I can't say enough great things about her. She was she was just, and, and the same applies to Mark. You know, Mark was uh, really terrific. Uh, uh, I can't again. He looking forward to hopefully, you know, once this thing gets out to the public or uh, we actually start talking to some entities about the future of this project, you know, like whether there's going to be more episodes or, or it's going to take a different form or what have you. I'm hoping that, you know, Mark and, and Sean will continue to be a part of whatever comes next. And the basic premise is, believe it or not, we initially started shooting. The story was written ten years ago. We, we shot, we shot it ten years ago, and we, we've been working on it in post production ever since. Okay, and it's only because of improvements in software um, that we were able to get it. Uh, like we we shot it in high definition. All right, and. It's only because of improvements in software that we were able to improve it so that you can actually show it on a 1080p you know resolution screen um, and, and you wouldn't even know the difference if it, same with other aspects of the post-production uh, the current technology is what enabled us to properly finish it so um, i'm very very happy about that but this, but getting back to the story we essentially anticipated uh, Trumpism before there was such a thing, you know. And as a matter of fact, uh, we have a clip on, on the Republic TV drama that shows how much we anticipated, it, you know, when we have uh, uh, ICE agents come to uh, pick up a family, you know, that essentially were born here in America and they're going to be deported to another country. They've never experienced, you know, and we shot that 10 years ago and, and you watch this, you know, in this day and age, and it's, and it's really chilling, you know, when you see what's going on. So, um, and there's a lot of things we anticipated, um, that, you know, we're, we're just seeing come to fruition now, uh, in reality, you know, because, you know, when I was initially showing a rough cut to people back then, they're saying, oh, wow, this is just, this is just so unreal. And now when people that I have seen, you know, what we have so far, they're going, this is really happening. So it's, it's, I, I can't wait till people get the full effect of this thing. It's, it's, it's going to be interesting. When can uh, viewers expect to uh, to uh, see Republic? When and where? Okay, We're, right now, I have people that are approaching various entities. You know the usual suspects as far as uh, you know where people can anticipate streaming it, that, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, maybe it gets expanded into a, a film series. I don't know. I'm looking at also entering it into uh, film festivals, get it out there. I, because right now I really, I know it's going to get out there. I mean, if worse comes to worse, you know, I'll upload it to iTunes and people will be able to download it. But that's not going to be uh, my initial reaction to it yet. Once we get the finished copy, I'm supposed to be getting the final print this week uh, for the thing. And actually, I'm going to be filing a copyright on this film, too. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. yeah. Should be getting... That's uh, 
perfect and with that we've come full circle from copyright to copyright yes <laughs>